Book four, chapter four of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume One, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter four, sentiments of Luther and Staupitz, order to appear, alarms and courage, the Elector with the Legate, departure for Augsburg, sojourn at Weimar, Nuremberg the arrival of melancthon doubtless gave a pleasant turn to luther's thoughts at this very critical moment and doubtless in the sweet intercourse of a growing friendship and amid the biblical labours to which he devoted himself with new zeal he sometimes forgot prierio leo and the ecclesiastical court before which he behoved to plead still these were only fleeting moments and his thoughts were ever recurring to the formidable tribunal before which implacable enemies had summoned him to appear what terrors would not this thought have thrown into a mind which was seeking aught else than the truth but luther trembled not confiding fully in the faithfulness and power of god he remained firm and was quite ready to expose himself single-handed to the rage of enemies mightier than those who had lighted the fire for john huss a few days after the arrival of melancthon and before the pope's resolution transferring the citation of luther from rome to augsburg could be known luther wrote spalatin i ask not our sovereign to do anything whatever for the defence of my theses i am willing to be delivered up and thrown single into the hands of my adversaries let him allow the whole storm to burst upon me what i have undertaken to defend i hope i shall be able with the assistance of christ to maintain violence indeed must be submitted to but still without abandoning the truth the courage of luther communicated itself to others men of the greatest gentleness and timidity on seeing the danger which threatened the witness for the truth found words full of energy and indignation the prudent and pacific Staupitz, on the seventh of september wrote to spalatin cease not to exhort the prince your master and mine not to be alarmed at the roaring of the lions let him defend the truth without troubling himself about luther or Staupitz or the order let there be a place where men can speak freely and without fear i know that the plague of babylon i had almost said of rome breaks forth against all who attack the abuses of those traffickers in jesus christ i have myself seen a preacher of the truth thrown headlong from the pulpit i have seen him though on a festival bound and dragged to a dungeon others have seen still greater cruelties therefore my dear friend strive to make his highness persevere in his sentiments the order to appear at augsburg before the cardinal legate at length arrived luther had now to do with one of the princes of the church all his friends entreated him not to go they feared that on the journey snares might be laid for him and an attempt made on his life some employed themselves in looking out for an asylum to him Staupitz himself, the timid Staupitz, felt moved at the thought of the dangers which threatened that Friar Martin whom he had drawn from the obscurity of the cloister and placed on the troubled stage where his life was now in peril. Ah, would it not have been better if the poor friar had remained for ever unknown? It was too late. Still, at least, he would do everything to save him accordingly on the fifteenth of september he wrote him from his convent of salzburg urging him to flee and seek an asylum beside himself it seems to me said he that the whole world is enraged and in coalition against the truth in the same way crucified jesus was hated i see not that you have anything to expect but persecution shortly no man will be able without the permission of the pope to sound the scriptures and search for jesus christ in them though this christ himself enjoins you have only a few friends and would to god that the fear of your adversaries did not prevent those few from declaring in your favour 
the wisest course is to quit Wittenberg for a time and come to me. Thus we will live and die together. This is also the prince's opinion, adds Staupitz. From different quarters Luther received the most alarming notices. Count Albert of Mansfeld sent a message to him to beware of setting out, for some great barons had sworn to make themselves masters of his person and to strangle or drown him but nothing could deter him. He never thought of availing himself of the vicar-general's offer. He will not go and hide himself in the obscurity of the convent of Salzburg, but will faithfully remain on the stormy scene on which the hand of God has placed him. It is by persevering in the face of adversaries and proclaiming the truth with loud voice in the midst of the world that the reign of truth advances. Why, then, should he flee? He is not one of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. The words of the master whom he serves, and loves better than life, are incessantly echoing in his heart, Whosoever will confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. In Luther and in the Reformation we uniformly meet with that intrepid courage, that high-toned morality, that boundless charity which the first preaching of Christianity manifested to the world. I am like Jeremiah, says Luther, at the period of which we are now speaking. Jeremiah, the man of quarrel and discord, but the more they multiply their menaces, the more they increase my joy. My wife and children are well provided, of course meaning he had none. My fields, my houses, and all my goods are in order. They have already torn my honour and my reputation to shreds. The only thing left me is my poor body, and let them take it. They will only shorten my life some few hours. My soul they cannot take from me. He who would publish the word of Christ in the world must expect death every hour, for our bridegroom is a bridegroom of blood. The elector was then at Augsburg. A short time before quitting that town after the diet, he had of his own accord paid a visit to the legate. The cardinal, greatly flattered by this mark of respect from so illustrious a prince, promised that if the monk presented himself he would listen to him like a father and kindly dismiss him. Spalatin, on the part of the prince, wrote to his friend that the pope had named a commission to try him in Germany, that the elector would not allow him to be dragged to Rome and that he must prepare to set out for Augsburg. Luther resolved to obey, but the warning which he had received from Count Mansfeld made him apply to Frederick for a safe conduct. Frederick replied that it was unnecessary, and merely gave him recommendations to some of the leading councillors of Augsburg. He also sent him some money for the journey. The reformer, poor and defenceless, set out on foot to place himself in the hands of his adversaries. What must have been his feelings on quitting Wittenberg and directing his steps towards Augsburg, where the legate of the Pope was waiting for him? The object of this journey was not like that of Heidelberg, a friendly meeting. He was going to appear in the presence of the legate of Rome without a safe conduct. Perhaps he was going to death. But in him faith was not a mere matter of show. Being a reality, it gave him peace, and in the name of the Lord of hosts he could advance without fear to bear testimony to the gospel. He arrived at Weimar on the 28th of September and lodged in the convent of the Cordeliers. One of the monks was unable to withdraw his eyes from him. It was Myconius. This was the first time he had seen Luther, and he longed to approach him and tell that he owed the peace of his soul to him and that his whole desire was to labour with him. But Myconius, being closely watched by his superiors, was not permitted to speak to Luther. The elector of Saxony was then holding his court at Weimar, and this is probably the reason why the Cordeliers gave admittance to the doctor. The day after his arrival, the feast of St. Michael was celebrated. Luther said Mass, and was even invited to preach in the church of the castle. It was a mark of favour which the prince wished to give him. 
he accordingly in the presence of the court preached a long sermon on the text of the day which is taken from the gospel of st matthew chapter eighteen verses one to eleven he spoke forcibly against hypocrites and those who boast of their own righteousness but he did not speak of the angels though this was the customary topic on st michael's day the courage of the doctor of wittemberg in calmly setting out on foot to obey a summons which in the case of so many before him had issued in death astonished those who saw him interest admiration and compassion succeeded each other in their minds john kestner superintendent to the cordeliers alarmed at the idea of the dangers which awaited his guest said to him brother you will find at augsburg italians men of learning and subtle antagonists who will give you much to do i fear you will not be able to defend your cause against them they will cast you into the fire and with their flames consume you luther replied gravely dear friend pray to our lord god who is in heaven and present a pater noster for me and his dear child jesus whose cause my cause is that he may be gracious towards me if he maintain his cause mine is maintained but if he pleases not to maintain it assuredly it is not i who can maintain it and it is he who will bear the affront luther continued his journey on foot and arrived at nuremberg he was going to present himself before a prince of the church and wished his dress to be suitable but his clothes were old and besides had suffered much by the journey he borrowed a frock from his faithful friend Wenceslaus link preacher at nuremberg luther doubtless did not confine his visit to link but also saw his other friends in nuremberg secretary Schirl, the celebrated painter albert durer to whom nuremberg is now erecting a statue and many others he strengthened himself by intercourse with the excellent of the earth while many monks and laymen expressed alarm and endeavoured to shake him by representing the difficulties in his way letters which he wrote from this town show the spirit by which he was animated i have met says he with pusillanimous men who would persuade me not to go to augsburg but i have determined on going the will of the lord be done even at augsburg even in the midst of his enemies jesus christ reigns let christ live let luther and every sinner die according as it is written let the god of my salvation be exalted behave well persevere stand firm for we must not be reproved either by men or by god god is true and man a liar link and an augustine monk could not consent to allow luther to travel alone and meet the dangers which threatened him they were acquainted with his bold and fearless character and suspected he would fail in due precaution they therefore accompanied him when they were about five leagues from augsburg luther exhausted no doubt by the fatigue of travelling and the varied emotions of his heart was seized with violent pains in the stomach he thought he was dying and his friends becoming very uneasy hired a car to transport him they arrived at augsburg on the evening of friday the seventh of october and lighted at the augustine convent luther was greatly fatigued but soon recovered his faith and mental energy speedily recruiting his exhausted body end of book 4 chapter 4